You may smile when you hear the phrase, Nick the Kick or Kick with Nick for cerebral palsy. That is so 1995. Nick Lowry still making a difference in the community through his foundation and all over the country. Nick joins us via Skype from his home in Arizona. Okay, May 10th, you'll be back in the neighborhood with Christian Okoye as yep. you head to El Dorado Springs, Missouri for an event that addresses anti-bullying. Why has that become so important to you? Well, it's not just anti-bullying. It's, it's just helping kids have the resources so that they spend their time you know, building their minds and bodies and souls in a good way. But um, I think because of the work I've done in leadership with Native Americans and kids around the country, uh, I, I think I've just noticed, Dave, how much with the new technologies, witness what we're using right now, Skype, um, especially phone technologies, cyberbullying has made it possible for what used to be a very mean-spirited interaction in a short period of time between two individuals into something that could, you know, permanently scar that person. And, and then just the desensitization of kids because it's so easy to text and not interact, see somebody, look them in the eye. And when you have a, a difficult world like we have had the last six years with the economy, People are scratching just to survive and pay bills, and parents sometimes uh, project that to their kids, that sense of tension. And so Champions Against Bullying is about empathy. It's about the connection we learned as athletes. You were a, an excellent athlete at, at K-State. For those of you that don't know, Dave Stewart, star, K-State. And um, you learn about working with others. You learn about teamwork. You learn about sacrifice. But what I learned recently with a team like Queen Creek High School that was featured by Rick Riley in Sports Illustrated and on ESPN is when kids are uh, able to learn how much sharing that attention they have is top of the food chain, if you will, in high school or even earlier with kids that are not cool at that point. It's a permanent lesson. They never forget it. Queen Creek went on to be the only undefeated team in the state, and they started sitting at lunch, the simple act of sitting at lunch with Shy Johnson, who was a developmentally disabled young person, not dissimilar from the kids we work with with Kick with Nick for cerebral palsy in Kansas City and with cerebral palsy here in Phoenix. And she blossomed when she was finally safe. She became their mascot. She had this amazing ability to perceive their unique personalities and make them feel special. So it became a love affair, a true love affair. And I interviewed not only the stars of that team, Dave, uh, they asked me to speak at their state championship uh, awards banquet, but I also interviewed the backups. And even the backups said, as much as winning the state championship was a lifetime memory, they cherished the lesson they learned about sharing that success with Shy and with others and what that meant for them. I mean, I just felt humbled because I know when I was 17 and 16, I hadn't figured that out. And to see kids that learn that now, that's my passion. It's just a beautiful thing. And by the way, we're also learning with this 50th anniversary of Columbine. Um, I actually work with uh, Aaron Nelson, who interviewed the families at Columbine afterwards for her PhD thesis in psychology. And it was the varsity athletes who created that toxic environment where those two young people felt so um, alienated that uh, instead of doing something stupid, they did something horrifically tragic that changed the landscape really in America in terms of school violence. But the thought is if you're bullied at 13 and it ends at 14, you might not be over it at 15 or 35. Why does this linger like it does? Well, it's it's uh, bullying, by the way, is not just a one time thing. It's a campaign. It's an in, intended sustained effort to damage somebody's self-esteem. So uh, we have statistics now. An NBC report about two months ago said that Kids that are bullied over a period of years are 750%. That's almost eight times more likely to have low self-esteem. Most kids and most of us, about 6% of the population is going through that sort of depression. Um, and then it's about 30% and 40% if it's just on a shorter term basis. But those are pretty big numbers. And I think when kids learn something that powerful about what real power is, which is sharing your success with others, not taking it away. 
Um, that leads to, frankly, football players that end up having longer careers, people that understand what real leadership's about. How do we all become champions against bullying, whether we're a parent, just a friend in the school community, uh, a teacher? How can we all get involved? Well, uh, certainly I'll come. I love what I do. I, I work with Delta Wood School right there in, in near Lee Summit uh, in Blue Springs. Uh, I've worked with six schools in Belleville, Kansas. I've done about 67 schools now. We work directly with the principals and the teachers and create um, a, a creative mindset where everyone in the school puts together a poster which expresses in their unique way why bullying isn't good and that creates a dialogue. So how you can get involved, parents are so important, whether it's education in general or whether it's how they look at the world and, and others that are not like them. Parents that are engaged completely sustain that effort or they can shut it down. So parents are always the most important. And that's the number one thing is to get the parents to see how good this is and how beautiful this is. It's not just a rock star, you know, sort of concert where you come in for a couple hours it's setting it up beforehand and then it's recognizing the kids that are going outside their comfort zone and doing good things for people that they don't even know simple things is sitting at lunch but it's also playing with the kids on the playground i mean when you learn that and when you're nine years old that's really powerful stuff then we have tremendous um research that shows that those things stick and then we keep doing that throughout the year in the summer we recognize kids as they come back in the fall what did you do? Did you set up a program where uh, kids deliberately sat at uh, kids that, with kids at lunchtime or did things where they embraced others um, in the classroom itself? So there is a mindset. If that person's different on the outside, absolutely doesn't mean they're different on the inside. In fact, you saw that shooting uh, at the Jewish Community Center uh, just this past week in Kansas City, such a tragedy. We want to do things that show that we didn't stand around, but we reached out to people that are of different religious, different ethnic faiths, and make that effort to connect and understand. Uh, that's what makes America great is, I'm sounding like a politician now, but I mean, that's what makes America great is that we challenge uh, assumptions about diversity. And we embrace everyone as having something unique, creative, and powerful to contribute. For more information about the May 10th event, the website lighthousechildrenstheater.org or nicklarryfoundation.org, a couple of places you can go to. All right, I know you work a lot with teenagers when it comes to the value of education, and a big part of the message is showing them that what they're learning matters and actually might come in handy someday. Are kids willing to buy that? Do they hear that message when you tell it to them? Oh, let me tell you this story. This is so cool. Shawnee Mission East, 1993. I just spent the off season and I had about a month left working for Bill Clinton in the Office of National Service in the White House. I've been there for three months. I had one more month to do it, helping launch AmeriCorps. And we'd worked with Senator Bond and Senator Dole and Senator Kassebaum and Senator Danforth, who helped make that the number one first bit of major legislation passed by the Clinton administration. And I went to speak during National Volunteer Week, which actually is right about the middle of April, like now to Shawnee Mission East, and they'd had 40 kids sign up for their school project the year before. And I simply spoke to their cafeteria. So imagine plates clanging and glasses and trays making lots of noise. And I simply said, how many of you, when you're sitting at your desk, how many of you feel like what I'm doing right now really is gonna help me? I, I understand how what I'm doing today is gonna pull me towards what I'm destined to do with my life, something that really matters. And for me, that's appropriate for my unique God-given gifts and that makes a difference. Almost, I mean, a ridiculous amount raised their hand and said, I really don't know. And I just said, I know one thing, when you get involved in the community like this project, it will pull you much more closer to feeling like you know what you need to do with your life. And these are the things that stimulate leadership, but also a sense of, of clarity of your purpose in life. And uh, this principal called me up, this is 1993, uh, yeah, 93, and said uh, about a month later, 400 kids signed up. 40, 400. Um, so kids need this. They really want to feel like what they're learning in school matters. Project-based learning is important. It's, it's getting your hands on something and taking those concepts and making it real and making a difference. Who doesn't want to feel like they've helped somebody out every day? Another way, uh, one of the ways you've given back to the community in Arizona is your champion for the homeless on Easter program. How'd Sunday go? How many did you feed? 
Oh, it was awesome. I, I, I'm i going to send you a picture and maybe you can put it up, but it's okay. pretty cool because my um, uniform looks so much like the Cardinals, but I'm wearing my proudly wearing my Chiefs Joe Delaney, by the way, um, jersey number eight with four Cardinals players. We had twice as many. We normally have around 800 homeless at St. Vincent de Paul's. This was our 21st and our eighth Easter, uh, but we had incredible musicians singing uh, and performing. And we served about, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400 people. We gave out, we give out hundreds and hundreds of flowers. We let the ladies hand out the flowers. I started the first year handing out flowers. It just didn't feel right, Dave. Uh, so we have the ladies hand out the flowers and we have hundreds of McDonald's gift certificates. Cause if you give a, a gift certificate to a really expensive restaurant, um, a homeless person sometimes doesn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, but it's just so, it's pure love. It's, it's just reminding yourself that you know, there but the grace of God go all of us. You know, all of us are equally important in the world. And so it went great. I love that. And um, this work just keeps building. And thank you so much. It makes a huge difference when people like you, Dave, and Metro Sports say, you know, this is important enough to share. This is really what's important. And I, I'd be honored to work with any high school, middle school, elementary school. The earlier we can start, the better to, uh, to teach these and encourage these kids. The NFL is always in tinker mode of the offseason. There was even some discussion about, well, let's not have kickoffs. Just put the ball at the 2025, 20, whatever, because kickoffs are pretty much train wrecks. There's so much going on. What are your thoughts about altering the game in a way that dramatic? Well, I think the idea of extra points, by the way, I had the number one percentage ever from 20 point extra points when I when I played. Uh, I think I missed five or, or so um, out of about 560. And I was very proud of that, but think about that statistic. It's almost automatic today. So moving it back to the 20-yard line, making it 30, I think that's a pretty cool idea. You'll still make, most guys will still make 90% of them, but it creates a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, the kickoffs, the new footballs now, ever since Tony Rumble, F Romo fumbled that ball against Seattle in the playoffs about five, six years ago, now the quarterbacks and the kickers have their balls uh, properly rubbed in that they can kick. So now the balls are traveling you look at the statistics, it's the most untold story. In Stenerud, Jan was sitting next to me at Chiefs Alumni Weekend talking about this, wanting, wanting me to talk about it. So I'll talk about it a little bit. If you look at the statistics the last six years, the punters' percentages and, and average punt, average net punt, the kickoffs, the field goals, the Denver kicker is a great, great kicker, maybe the best kicker in the NFL. But, I mean, he's like 11 for 11 over 50. The percentage of 50-yard field goals has gone way up. It's just way past humanly possible for people to suddenly the DNA in human beings to improve that much. So they've got to do something. Um, kickers, by the way, they don't punish quarterbacks when they throw for 51 touchdown passes. But when kickers do well, we always get dumped on. <laughs> Justin Tucker's made like 92% of his kicks over the last two years. Are you yeah. surprised that that number is so high? I figured they'll put in like a lead weighted football now because the kickers are just doing too well. Um, that's really impressive. And Justin Tucker, I think, is from a small prep school in Texas. He came out of nowhere. It's a great story. Um, kickers are getting better. Um, I, I don't think uh, they'd kick as well with the footballs we used back then, but kickers keep getting better as well. I think the training overall for all players keeps getting better. Um, I'm not sure about narrowing the goalpost, but uh, I think these initial things with extra points and kickoffs is a start. As important as kicking would seem to be, a lot of colleges are not going to offer the scholarship to a kid out of high school. They want them to walk on and earn that scholarship. Can you explain that? Does that make sense to you? Um, I think this is probably a dialogue you've had before. Um, so what's happening now, you're saying, is there are less and less scholarships that are automatic. You have to make the team. Yeah, they want you to, to be able to come to college and earn your spot before they give you that scholarship. I think that's pretty unfair, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, when I went to college, which was, of course, before footballs were made of leather, I mean, it was so far back that, you know, we actually had gorillas as part of the offensive line. Seriously, um, it was only like $7,500. Now it's at Dartmouth College where I went, it's 55, 60,000. A lot of the schools are over 20, 30, 40, 50,000. The average debt now for a kid coming out of college is 30 to 60,000. For a graduate student, it's 200,000. It's just really unfair to put that kind of burden that that person has got so much pressure when they're trying to just do the pressured thing of learning in a difficult college 
environment, which is new to them, learning uh, on their own in their new independent living circumstances. I think that's asking a bit too much, don't you? Yeah, I, I really do. You're still the Chiefs' all-time leading scorer at 1,466 points. Congratulations. Is that number untouchable? I'm never going to say that. Never say never. Uh, I, I do want to uh, say that I think that um, the kicker for the Chiefs now, Ryan, is an excellent kicker. And the, the thing that I noticed today in coverage of the NFL is if a guy has one or two good years, they start saying he's a Hall of Famer. You're a Hall of Famer because you're good every year year after year for at least eight, 10 years at any position. I, I'm disappointed that they rush to judgment. So Ryan's going to show his mettle. He's a good Christian guy. He's hardworking. Uh, and he'll come back and have a good year this year. That's that's the test of all great players is, you know, I didn't make every kick and you got to learn from your mistakes. That's how we're wired as human beings. We learn the most from our mistakes. Uh, I'll never forget, I'll bring it up, the Cleveland game in 1989, I missed three field goals, two that counted, and it crushed me. And I just dedicated myself harder than I ever had and came back and led the NFL in scoring and made 24 in a row. So that's what you have to do. You have to dig deeper. All of us do that in life with adversity. And if we do dig deeper, we find always, we find, I ask God for help too. I'll say that, that always helps. And we, we tap into parts of us we never knew we had. But it's crazy now. If you're not at 80% plus, your job's in jeopardy. All right. Yeah. A, a good year it, for a kicker, 120 points yep. a season, yep. over 12, 13 years to be able to catch and break your record. That's a lot to ask of suck up or the kicker that comes after him. You may be, but, you may be safe. <laughs> well, let me just say this. I think Ryan's a really good person, and I think he's very talented. And I, I wish him a lot of luck. I think the Chiefs would really make a mistake. Uh, by finding somebody else. I think he deserves another year, and he'll come right back and kick really well. Thanks for your time. Good catching up. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Always enjoy it. Nick Lowry, yeah. our guest on Time Warner Cable Sports Channel.